Hi, I'm Zach Zacharias. I'm the Senior Curator of Education and History at the Museum of Arts and Sciences in Daytona Beach. I'm on the east bank of Lake Monroe, which is part of the St. Johns River, and I have my kayaks here ready to go. And we're going to take a little trip, a little afternoon with Florida history, and we're going to go check out the ruins of an old wharf that belonged to one of the first great tourist hotels in Florida called the Brock House. One of the great things about kayaking is uh, you always see a lot of wildlife just past an eight foot gator. Unfortunately, I couldn't get it on camera, but we've passed uh, a lot of jumping mullet. Hopefully one won't jump in the kayak. Uh, and then I saw a great, awesome blue heron. I got about a mile of kayaking to do, uh, but Jacob Brock, who was one of the pioneer steamboat captains, one of the first on the river of the St. John's, when he would bring tourists to his hotel that's about a 206 mile journey from Jacksonville. The Brock House was built in 1856 and could accommodate 100 travelers and they came from all over the world to enjoy the wonders of the Florida frontier. The Brock House before the Civil War was serving mostly invalids, but after the Civil War, Jacob Brock was laying the foundations of one of Florida's greatest industries, tourism. At times, the Brock House Hotel was so crowded that guests even slept on the billiard tables. The journey to discover these old wooden wharf ruins takes me past large cypress trees covered in Spanish moss, giving it an old Gothic Florida feel. This lake back in the Gilded Age must have been teeming with fish, exotic birds, and the woods plentiful with deer and bear would have made this a sportsman's paradise. Hazen Peavy, a northerner who managed Jacksonville's Judson House Hotel, became the first manager of the Brock House. The hotel had hired cooks and waiters from up north for the care and reception of guests. It was said by one visitor, quote, From Jacksonville to Enterprise, no hotel equaled the Brock House. It's a hot August day, and I'm getting pretty close to these old wharf ruins. I've seen them from the road, but getting up close to them is going to be really cool. I'm just about a hundred yards away. The only remnants that the Brock House ever existed sits right out here in Lake Monroe. It took me about 30 minutes to kayak up here, and now I'm here at these old wooden pylons, which are part or remnants of the old wharf from the Brock House. These wooden pylons well over 100 years old, probably 130 years old, and they served uh, the guests who were coming here. The steamboat would pull up, like his personal steamboat, the Darlington, would pull up right out there at the end, and then the passengers would get off, and then they would head on to the Brock House, which would just be opposite here, east, on the shore. Really large hotel, one of the first northern-style hotels, as I said earlier, that uh, serviced a wealthier northern clientele. And they were bringing invalids down here before the Civil War, and then after the Civil War, they were bringing uh, sportsmen, people who were interested in uh, finding a sportsman's paradise. Think about the fish and the hunting that would have been here uh, after the Civil War uh, during that Gilded Age period from 1865 to 1900. It was Jacob Brock's new regularly scheduled trips up and down the St. John's River that was the beginning of the tourist trade on the river. Brock eventually had a whole line of steamships that helped open up the St. John's area to visitors and settlers. It was said that the first Brock trip to Enterprise consisted of one traveler and the return cargo, one cowhide. This was the last part of civilization in Florida in the Gilded Age. Anything further south of here was pure frontier. So this is the last stop on the Florida frontier. There may have been a few people living in South Florida, but they would have been hermits. Really nothing south of here. This is it. 110 feet of the hotel fronted Lake Monroe. 
It had no running water. And waiters brought you fresh water in pitchers every day. The rooms were heated with fireplaces. A lot of famous guests stayed here. Grover Cleveland, Jay Gould, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and a couple people we know here locally, Henry DeLand, Frederick DeBerry. The Brock House also had a lush orange grove adjacent to the hotel as seen in this rare photograph. Excursions were popular as seen with this horse and guide taking a guest to another fishing hotspot, probably a nearby small lake given the size of the craft. Camping was a popular excursion at the Brock House. It would have been a must-do for the sportsman as seen in this really rare photograph. Feeding guests and keeping them well-fed was always a top priority, and in 1890, the Brock House actually had a lunchbox. This rare artifact would have gone with you on the day's adventure. This detailed engraving shows the Brock House on the front of the lunchbox. Scottish-born entrepreneur Robert Gare invented the paperboard folding carton in 1890, and it was done by accident. He found that cutting and creasing paper board in one operation could produce a prefabricated carton. This is indeed a Robert Gare manufactured lunchbox out of New York, as we can see his logo underneath. This wharf extended really far out from the shore of the hotel, the Brock House, and the reason why is it's really shallow, and these steamboats, like his personal steamboat, the Darlington, uh, had to go way out here on the dock. The dock is just behind me. And this wharf actually had rails on it so they could load the luggage of all these tourists. A couple of characteristics of Jacob Brock was that he was a kind-hearted man, but also had a very vulgar mouth, and he could swear like nobody's business. During the Civil War, his steamship was uh, captured, the Darlington, in the Cumberland Sound area off of Fernandina, and he was in prison for the entirety of the war as a POW. Competition grew heavy on the river, and in 1876, Jacob Brock voluntarily declared bankruptcy. And he sold his hotel to Luther Campbell, who in that same year sold it to the firm of Bodine and McCarthy, who expanded the hotel and created a popular reading library with over a thousand books. In that same year, 1876, Jacob Brock unexpectedly died. The ravages of time took their toll on the Brock House and this old wharf. In 1936, the Brock House was purchased uh, and torn down. These wood pillars stand like fossils of a bygone era. They've been here for a very long time, standing as sentinels of Florida's past history. Will they stand for another 20 years, 50 years, 100 years? Who knows? What we're going to do right now is go down to Green Springs, which was part of the whole Brock House experience. Behind me is Green Springs. It's about a mile from the Brock House. It was part of the whole vacation package when you came to the Brock House Hotel. You could swim in the healing waters. It's green, it's very sulfury. I can smell the sulfur right now. Uh, this spring is a short run and it flows out to Lake Monroe. People coming to the Brock House, especially before the Civil War, were coming to Green Springs because of the healing powers of it. They suffered from an illness called consumption which was tuberculosis. It was believed back then that it was an inherited disease, that you had weak lungs. In 1937, the expansion of the Children's Methodist Home replaced the once famous Brock House Hotel. I'm Zach Zacharias. I'm the Senior Curator of Education and History at the Museum of Arts and Sciences. Thanks for coming along my afternoon with Florida History and the Brock House. <laughs>